we were discussing the different techniques being used for embedded system design. In the last class, we have looked at task graph and how high level transformations can be applied to the task graph to make it more amenable for hardware software co-designing. Today, we shall continue our discussions on hardware software co-design. So, the major tasks to recapitulate uh, we know are that of partitioning the system function into small interacting pieces, then allocating these partitions to microprocessors that means a pure software implementation or to other hardware units that means we are using a dedicated hardware okay, for implementation of these elements. Then scheduling the times at which these functions are executed, okay, then it becomes a scheduling problem. But for doing all these things, we need to do mapping. Mapping a generic functional description into an implementation on a particular hardware or may be implemented using a set of hardware components. So, I need to have, if I want to do this mapping, I need to know what are the different possibilities. Depending on the possibilities, we shall do this mapping. So, the design space exploration would mean a candidate architecture must be proposed. When we are proposing a candidate architecture, that means we are making a choice among the possibilities of the target architecture in terms of processor, also in terms of the hardware components which can be put together to make dedicated hardware. And then we shall find out the potential performance bottlenecks in the architecture identified. We shall do modifications to the architecture okay, because we would like and need to remove these bottlenecks to meet performance constraints. Finally, we shall choose one configuration based on the results of performance analysis and other requirements like design time, manufacturing cost, etc. So, obviously, you can understand the performance analysis is a critical component. Whenever we are proposing an architecture, we need to evaluate that architecture on the basis of performance criteria. Now, this design space exploration can be done by actually implementing and trying out different alternatives. Okay. So, it process can be completely manual. Otherwise, we can also have automated schemes formulating the problem as a formal optimization problem and then exploring the design space. We shall look at both these approaches in today's class. So, effectively what we are looking at is that we have the behavior, the task graph, we partition, we get software part, hardware part, we can do the compilation, do the hardware synthesis, then do a simulation of the two things together okay? and that simulation can actually provide the performance statistics. If I find that I am meeting my performance constraint, then I can accept the design, else I shall go back, try out alternate partitioning, alternate architecture and repeat this process. So, this process can be done through manual intervention or can be done in an automated fashion provided we have enough statistics and computer aided tools to estimate the performance. So, therefore, the steps which are involved are consider the task model. We have seen in the last class the task model for depicting behavior of the target system. This task model can come from high level modeling which can be represented through an UML notation. Then we can come to the task model and uh, in the task model the computations can be represented at each node in various ways. One of the way to represent it could be using an imperative language like C and apply high level transformations to these nodes or to the task graphs. We have already discussed the high level transformations. Uh, in terms of computations, we have looked at different ways to deal with loops, different ways to nest the loop so that we can have optimality in terms of cache access. We have also looked at uh, the possibilities of merging nodes or splitting nodes, taking care of I O requirements. So, these are all high level transformations that we can apply on the task graph. 
And then if we are looking at each compile uh, at computation at each node, I can subject it to a compilation. If I am doing this compilation and compiling it for the target processor, effectively we are doing a straight software implementation. You can look at it in this way. If I am doing that way, then I can get the computation of the uh, resulting program size, estimation of the resulting execution time. We might need to do a simulation of input data to do these estimations. And if required, we shall be designing the hardware components. In fact, we can use system C or VHDL to represent the hardware specification of the nodes. That means hardware design of the nodes that is to be implemented. Okay? That specification can be a top level specification. So, let us look at a simple example, a simple digital camera design and through this we shall look at explorations of alternate design possibilities. Here we are not talking about strictly an automated methodology for doing this alternate design uh, explorations. Okay? So, design space exploration would be only on the basis of manual suggestions and trying out the different possibilities. We are not looking at a formal formulation of the search problem. So, what are the tasks for a digital simple digital camera? A digital camera's basic task is to process image and store them in memory. So, when the shutter is pressed, the image gets captured. The image is converted to digital form by charge couple device, we are using the charge couple CCD sensors and they are compressed and archived in internal memory. Okay? That is the memory internal to that of the camera. We would also like the feature to support uploading of images to PC. Okay? So, the digital camera can be attached to PC via a very simple serial link and you can have special software commands for the camera to transmit archived images seriously, serially. So, these are the basic tasks that are to be realized in a digital camera. So, let us look at the CCD image sensors. So, CCD is a charge coupled device. Okay? They are electronic devices that are capable of transforming a light pattern into an electric charge pattern that is an electronic image. The CCD consists of several individual elements that have the capability of collecting, storing and transporting electrical charge from one element to other. The amount of electrical charge accumulated would depend on the intensity of incident illumination. That is together the photosensitive properties of silicon used to design image sensors. And these CCD sensors typically arranged in the form of array, rows and columns and from there the data corresponding to the image is collected. So, each CCD site can correspond to a single pixel in your image. Now, when we are using a CCD, there are one important issue which we need to look at and consider which is called a zero bias error. Okay? Because manufacturing errors cause cells to measure slightly above or below the actual light intensity. That means, the sensitivity can vary. So, we need to have a measure of the sensitivity so that we can actually correct the CCD readings. So, what is found is that error is typically same across columns, but different across rows. So, some of the leftmost columns, if this is a CCD array and these are the values corresponds to the values sensed at each of the CCD site, then the cells a two cells corresponding to each row is covered. That means, no light is incident on them. Now, we measure the sensed current okay, corresponding to these sites. So, we get what is called a zero bias. So, the zero bias have to be subtracted to the reading corresponding to other sites to get the corrected value. Okay? So, what we say that some of the leftmost columns are blocked by black paint to detect zero bias error and reading of other than zero in block cells is zero bias and that is subtracted. So, here I have done an averaging okay? 
and I have got this value, this value has to be subtracted to get the corrected pixel values. Obviously, this involves computation. So, zero bias error adjustment is a computational node in the task graph. Then the images are to be compressed so that they can be stored in the internal memory. The two motivations for this is to store images and transmit image to PC in less time. Typically, what we use and what we are talking about here is a JPEG compression. We shall not go into the details of the JPEG compression, but we shall briefly look at the steps in order to understand the design. So, image data is divided into blocks of 8 cross 8 pixels and 3 steps are performed on each block, discrete cosine transform, quantization, Huffman coding which is nothing but entropy coding. So, how is the DCT done? In fact, DCT is basically that of transforming the data from the spatial domain to that of frequency domain. So, for each 8 cross 8 block, we apply the forward discrete cosine transform. The expression for the discrete cosine transform is this. So, these d x y corresponding to pixel value okay, and what you get after transformation is f u v which corresponds to the frequency domain representation okay. and this is actually you will find that each of these elements is obtained over by cons over the entire 8 cross 8 block. So, when I have got f 0 0 that basically means I am looking at the d c component and u and v corresponds to spatial frequencies in both the directions because it is a two dimensional data. So, I shall have two frequency values. Okay. So, once we have these we get f u v why we do this kind of a transformation the whole idea is that if I do this frequency domain transformation I shall have the energy concentrated into few coefficients. See in an 8 cross 8 block I have got 64 values. If I do a frequency domain transformation and consider for example, I am just considering a image block which consists of a single color. If I do a frequency domain transformation, then the energy would get concentrated for f 0 0 and other values will be negligible. So, I am left with only one value rather than 64 values. So, that is the basic principle of energy concentration and DCT provides me a good tool for concentrating the signal energy into few coefficients. That is why DCT is used in JPEG. When I would like to decompress the image, I have to apply inverse DCT, the inverse DCT will give me back the original pixel values. Obviously, this computation you can see will take place in real domain that means it would really involve floating point calculations if we do not take any special measure. Next step is quantization because quantization reduce bit precision of encoded data. So, if values are small I can use a threshold and make them 0. If they are 0 then obviously I need not code them or store information about them. So, a very simple way is one way is to divide all values by a factor of 2. Okay. Simple right shifts can do this. If I divide by the value of 2, divide by a factor of 2, then what happens? The magnitude gets reduced. Since the magnitude gets reduced, the number of bits that can be used for storing can be less. Here I am giving you an example that I am dividing each content of each cell by 8, dividing the content of each cell by 8 this is the DCT value okay, which you have obtained and this is dividing by 8. If I divide by 8, you will see the range of values are changing. Obviously, I can use much smaller number of bits to represent these values. This is the basic motivation for quantization step and the lossiness of the image compression comes from quantization. Because of quantization, we are losing information. So, it is a lossy compression scheme that we are talking about. So, you can understand that this quantization will also involve computation at least a division operation 
and I would like to do maybe a divisions by uh, factors of 2 simply because that can be achieved by simple shift operations. Then we do Huffman coding. For Huffman coding what you do? Serialize 8 cross 8 block of pixels. Values are converted into single list using a zigzag pattern. In fact, the values are read in in this pattern. Why it is done in this way? Because if you look at, look at it, see this coefficient and this coefficient are conceptually similar in nature because this is representing the first component okay, in x direction, this is representing in y direction. So, depending on the frequency content of the image, you can consider that if there are uh, no changes in x, there may be very low changes in y as well. So, these two coefficients may have similar values. And as I am moving ahead, I am actually considering coefficients corresponding to greater frequency. Okay? So, it may so happen that uh, in an image, if you see any natural phenomena, if I am taking an image of a natural external world, the changes are smooth, changes are not really sharp if we are not taking images uh, of artificially generated uh, patterns. So, it is more or less smooth, the major part of it will be smooth. So, high frequency values can actually turn out to be very small and through a quantization process, those high frequency values may become actually 0. So, then you do, once you have therefore, the sequence of these values, where many of them are 0 because of quantization, you perform Huffman coding. Okay? In fact, you group them together to form symbols and form Huffman coding. So, more frequently occurring pixels are assigned short binary code because that is the basic principle of Huffman coding and entropy coding and longer binary codes are left for less frequently occurring pixels because depending on the entropy, the codes are associated. So, each pixel in serial list is converted to Huffman encoded values, much shorter list and thus comparison because we are not using same number of bits for representing each and every pixel value. You are using different number of bits depending on probability of occurrence of that pixel value. In fact, actually you do not use individual pixel values, but you actually look at the group of these values for the purpose of Huffman coding. So, this is another computational tasks. So, next if I have done the compression, what shall I do? I shall be archiving the image. Okay? I would like to store the image. So, storing the image would be in the memory okay? and I can keep uh, global memory address assigned and reserved for the different memories. Okay? So, we can set aside memory for n addresses and n image size variables and the image in the image memory requirement would be based on n that is the image size and the average compression ratio. Okay? So, that would give you the number of bytes required for storing an image on an average. Okay? So, you actually initialize addresses and image size variables, these are the basic algorithm which will be involved. Assuming addresses image size variables occupy n into 4 bytes, okay? allocating 4 bytes and first image is archived starting at address n into 4 and subsequent will be at the offset of compressed image size. Therefore, once you have stored these images depending on the requirement, we shall be connecting it to a PC and upload command. So, read images from memory. So, that means it will transmit serial using URT. While transmitting, you need to reset pointers image size variables and global memory pointer accordingly because you have to keep track that you have finished transmitting a single image. Okay? So, image after image is to be transmitted sequentially and the pointer adjustment have to be done by the software. So, therefore, if we now summarize, if we now remember the task graph, what are the different steps involved in a task graph? Zero bias adjustment. DCT, quantization okay, and entropy coding, quantization and entropy coding, archiving in memory and uploading to PC when required. 
these are the basic steps or the nodes in your task graph and what I need I need to map them to the processor or to dedicated hardware depending on my design constraints. I have just specified the task I have not really looked at yet the design constraints. I have just considered one possibility that image size let us consider 64 cross 64. So, what are the different kinds of design matrix which would be feasible and possible? The most important is performance. The time required to process image is 1 second and this should be constrained. What does that mean? That means, I cannot choose a possible architecture where the time taken to compress and store an image would be greater than 1 second. Such architectures have to be rejected. So, this is a constraint. The other design matrix are size, the number of elementary logic gates, two input NAND gates in IC. Okay. So, number of logic gates would determine the area or the size of the chip which is required. So, this is, this is what we want to optimize. We would want to optimize power measure of average electrical energy consumed while processing and energy is battery lifetime that is power into time. What is this time? This time is the time taken to process an image. Okay? So, that is the energy. We would like to optimize size, power and energy and this is a constraint which I might satisfy. So, you can see that actually exploration in a design space is that for searching a solution which meets the constraint and optimizes the parameters that we are looking for. So, what we say the metric can be both constraint and optimization. So, here I have got one constraint parameter and remaining are some kind of optimization parameters. Let us look at possible implementations and I say that we are looking at a manual exploration of the design space. So, when we can use microcontroller alone? Let us take an example of in Intel 8051 microcontroller. What is the motivation for choosing this architecture? The total cost small, well below 200 megawatt of power consumption, time to market will be less because you need to just simply write software. So, this is an assumption. However, look at these possibilities, one image per second not possible because it typically works with 12 megahertz with 12 cycles per instruction. So, it will execute 1 million instructions per second. Now, reading out from CCDRA require nested loops resulting in 4096 iterations of the order of 100 assembly instructions in each iteration. So, you have to execute 4096 into 100 instructions per image which consumes the half of the budget because your budget was 1 second. Okay? because time constraint was 1 second. So, half of the budget is getting consumed would be over budget after adding compute intensive DCT and half man coding. Okay? So, obviously, this is not a feasible or acceptable architecture. So, you can see that if I simply take the C code corresponding to the computations subject it to a compiler which we generate 8051 code and estimate the runtime of the code we find that the constraint cannot be met. Okay. So, if the constraint cannot be made, I have to look at alternate possibilities. So, implementation 2 could be an SOC approach, microcontroller and dedicated hardware. Here, we are talking about say image read function, CCD uh, read function implemented on a custom single purpose processor. Okay. It improves performance, less microcontroller cycles easy to implement because just, it just needs to do what read and subtract. Okay. Simple data path, so that such a processor would have a very simple data path and few states in control. In fact, the whole thing can be represented by a simple FSM and what you need, you need an implementation of that FSM in a dedicated hardware. Then also we can also use UAT that is uh, uh, universal asynchronous receiver transmitter as a single purpose processor. It should have along with it EEPROM for program memory and RAM for data memory added as well. In fact, that can provide the storage for the intermediate processing and EEPROM will have the program. 
So, this is a kind of an SOC based approach that we are talking about. Uh, here you have 8051, you are we are putting in an EURT here, we are putting in a special purpose processor which will communicate with the CCD and do the adjustments. This is a RAM and this is a EEPROM. EEPROM is the programmable EEPROM which has got the program to run the system. So, how to do that design? In fact, one way of the design is to develop the SOC. In fact, other way could be using 8051 as a discrete component and using all this as an external devices. What we are looking at? We are looking at a possibility of implementing a SOC. Now, if we are doing that, then we got to have the specification of the processor also in a core form, soft core form. I have talked about the whole design approach based on soft core. So, if it is available in a soft core, then 8051 specification, it should be possible for me to have in VHDL and captured at register transfer level. This obviously would specify the complete architecture and its operations. Okay. So, we have already seen VHDL. So, basically I shall have description of the processor in terms of the VHDL code. Okay. So, it has got the controller, the ALU, instruction decoder, 4K ROM and 128 RAM. These are internal memory. So, the whole description of the processor and the how the processor works have to be captured through your VHDL code. Now, you can buy if you are talking about a soft processor code and somebody is selling it out, licensing out the core, it means this VHDL code is being supplied to you. If the VHDL code is supplied to you, you can even modify the code depending on your requirements. And when you are designing an SOC, what is required? I shall write the VHDL code for the additional hardware components. We shall also the specify the bus interconnect structure. We shall also specify the memory which can be used by both this 8051 as well as your other dedicated hardware. So, first let us look at an URT. So, these are the different states that URT can have. It is originally in an ideal state. Okay. Now, when it is invoked, that is when the transmission has to be done, it is start transmission. Okay. And a typical, if you are familiar with RS232C kind of a protocol, what it will do? It will have a start bit, bring the line low. So, it is the start. Then it transmits the data depending on the data format. So, it is say 8 bit data has been transmitted then it will go to the stop bit and again go back when it is transmitting a sequence of such bytes. So, this is a basic FSM which needs to be implemented with provision for appropriate data buffer registers to store the data as well as to transfer the data. Okay. So, effectively what we are telling is that uh, uh, I can implement this FSM, but how should it be? interface with 8051. So, we are using memory mapped communication between 8051 or and all single purpose processors. What does that mean? The registers of these processor would be in the memory map of 8051 and lower 8 bits of memory address is for RAM, upper 8 bits of memory address for memory mapped I O devices. Okay. So, this is uh, available to me because now I can add the VHDL code corresponding to this URT implementation. Similarly, the image read can be done in a similar way. Okay. So, we have got an internal buffer B which is memory mapped to 8051. The variables R, C are buffers row and column indices. Get row state reads in one row from CCD. So, if it is reading in one row from CCD, it will get 64 pixels to blacked out pixels. The compute bias computes bias for that row and stores in variable bias. If there are two pixels, it would be an average. And fixed bias iterates over the same row, subtracting bias from each element. Okay. And next row transitions to get row for repeat. So, this becomes effectively the FSM to do bias error adjustment and the memory read. So, this can be again mapped into VHDL and I can have a dedicated hardware doing this function. Okay. And uh, how does it uh, interacts with external CCD? 
and mainly because combining CCD with ordinary logic not feasible, so that will communicate via this buffer. Now, we need to what we have got? We have got EURT, we have got the special purpose processor to do bias error adjustments. Now, we need to connect this SOC components. In fact, connection of SOC components is basically the glue logic using which the different components can get connected. So, all single purpose processors and RAM are connected to 8051's memory bus. So, what is the basic read operation? The processor places address on the 16 bit address bus, asserts read control signals, reads data from 8 bit data bus one cycle later. The device can be RAM or special purpose processor because special purpose processor also memory mapped with respect to 8051. Detects asserted read control signal, checks address, places and holds requested data on data bus for one cycle. So, this is the glue logic which has to also go into the special purpose processors which are being implemented. Similar thing will be done for write. The processor places address and data on address and data bus, asserts control signal. The device detects asserted write control signal, checks address bus, reads and stores data from the data bus. Okay. So, this becomes the basic protocol if you see why this becomes important. This defines the basic protocol for the special purpose processors to communicate with microcontroller 8051. So, next question is comes that of evaluating this architecture. So, what I have got? I have got my processor in VHDL, I have got the special purpose processors also written in VHDL. We have also defined how they can communicate with each other. So, I have got the complete design of SOC in a in VHDL form. So, test SOC, so we can test the SOC on VHDL simulator, we need not actually fabricate the system, which interprets VHDL descriptions and functionally simulates execution of the system. So, on the simulator one job is to test for correct functionality, that means whether I have written the VHDL code correctly. And it can also measure clock cycles to process one image. So, this number of clock cycles will give you an indication of the performance. Next, we can go to the gate level design. Okay. When you go to the gate level design, we are going through a process of synthesis. Okay. When we are at a register level design, we can get the clock cycles. But further down, we can get the gates through a process of synthesis. Once we have the gate, so what we can do? Simulate gate level models to obtain data for power analysis. There are various power estimation techniques. Uh, we can try to use some of them to get a estimate of the power. So, the number of times a very simple way of estimating is the number of times a gate switches from 1 to 0, 0 to 1. If you remember when we discussed this power aware architecture, we said that these transitions is a source of power consumption. So, if I simply count these, this gives you an estimate of power, not ac accurately the power consumption. And you count the number of gates for cheap area. So, I can get therefore, through this simulation and synthesis tools an estimation of the performance of the system. Obviously, this is a very simplified picture, whole all, all these performance estimation measures and how they have to be implemented at complex tasks, but in principle we have tools to do this kind of estimation. Okay. So, once we have the estimation, we can evaluate the architecture. Okay. So, what is the evaluation? We find the total execution time for processing one image turns out to be 9.1 second, power consumption is 0 0.033 watt, energy consumption is 0 0.3 joule because I am multiplying this and total cheap area is this many gates. I am violating these constraints and hence this design is also not acceptable. So, what do we do? The next option is the next option is to look at the DCT. If you remember, we said one high level transformation was to go from floating point to fixed point representation okay, in the task graph. So, uh, in fact, if we do a profiling, we shall find that DCT operation is the uh, takes major time. Okay. And we could design custom hardware, it is more complex, so design effort. Let us, we can therefore, try out alternate possibilities. In fact, DCT uses 260 floating point operation per pixel transforms. And 
in fact 8051 does not support floating point calculations. So that has to be taken care of by the compiler, compiler needs to generate instructions to do the floating point calculations using basically integer operations. So each procedure uses tens of integer operations okay. In fact an estimate is greater than 10 million integer operations per image of size 64 cross 64 and the procedures increase code size. So other possibility is whether we can transform it into a fixed point representation. There may be lack of precision but when we are representing an image that lack of precision may not be critical enough because in any case we are doing quantization. So what, how do we do a fixed point arithmetic? In fact what we do we use fixed number of bits in the word to represent the fractional part of the, uh, of the binary number. So if we put the real value by uh, 2 raised to the power number of bits used for the fractional part we are actually getting the representation. So this is a simple illustration all of you know this that we can represent 3.14 as 8 bit integer with 4 bits for fraction. So effectively if it is a 4 bits for fraction then why I am multiplying this because here each bit is representing actually 0 0.0625 okay it will be 1 by 16th right. So I am multiplying the value by 16 to get the actual integer representation so that we can work with fixed point. So what we are doing getting effectively since the this is the precision we are getting depending on the number of bits we are using. So that introduces approximation. So 3.125 is actually representing 3.14. So this is an approximation error. But what is the advantage? Advantage is now I can do say operations like addition by simply add integer representations okay. So this integer representation shows you that when the result is 5.85 I get 5.8125 because here the uh, these bits are integer remaining are the fractional bits. Even the multiplication can be done through integer operations okay. So you shift result right by the number of bits in fractional part okay. So effectively what we get is these results okay because that many shifting has to be done this boils down to adjustment of the binary point. So range of real values used is limited by bit widths of possible resulting values but what is more interesting to note is that you are actually using straightforward integer operations to deal with real valued op calculations. So that reduces the instruction count substantially and that is one of the reasons why I said that we might look like to do this kind of high level transformations of the task graph nodes to get optimal solution. So this is a transformation that we are doing because we need it. So then we go into an implementation. So this is what this is a pure again we have not done any change in the architecture. We have simply done a transformation of a task level node okay. So we get these kind of uh, statistics what you find is that since the time reduces the energy consumption is less the battery life becomes longer. So all these parameters in a various way are dependent okay. The total chip area is this and the gates are less why because your less memory is needed for code because code size reduces your procedures goes off okay you are using single instructions so your memory requirement reduces. You can realize why these transformations are important when you are going into design for portable devices. So but performance is close but not good enough. So finally I have to go for a codec, a dedicated codec for implementation of DCT okay. That becomes a special purpose hardware. So under that condition we can bring it down to 0 0.099 seconds. I am not going into the details of the design of the codec but these standard codecs are available and that would be also available with VHDL code. You can generate and design the glue logic and get the system. So here the power consumption is less increase over 2 and 3 because SOC has another processor. So the power consumption increases but what is less is energy consumption why because again the time goes down. So the battery life becomes longer okay. So total chip area is more because you are using another dedicated processor. So this is a kind of a manual exploration of the 
design space. Now, we can also have a formal formulation of this problem. So, before going into the formal formulation, let us try to get the overall picture. So, what are the different architectures we have tried? Microcontroller, pure software implementation, microcontroller and a coprocessor that is with additional hardware. So, I have mapped some things to the hardware, but still slow. We have looked at fixed point arithmetic, then we have looked at additional coprocessor for compression. So, obviously, what you find is a trade off between hardware and software to meet the performance constraints. So, if we now look at more formal specification of the problem on the basis of our uh, analysis of this example. So, what is that formal formulation? So, what we are telling is given a system description in terms of task graph with timing goal, a set of target architecture accompanied by a set of architectural constraints. Target architecture was say 8051 and possible implementation of F FSMs into with the help of VHDL okay. and a cost function that estimates quality of the solution. The design problem or the partitioning problem is that of finding a mapping of each node in the task graph to a processing unit. A processing unit can be specially designed or can be standard processor and also the starting time. In the previous example, we have not looked at the problem of scheduling because it is a typical sequential operation while minimizing the cost function. Fine. So, if I have a set of possible architectures specified beforehand, then the whole problem becomes a optimization problem, a standard optimization problem. Okay. And we can use standard optimization problem based techniques for doing hardware software co-design. So, let us look at uh, one such problem which is integer programming. I think many of you and all of you are familiar with this integer programming as an optimization scheme. So, what we are trying to optimize? We are trying to optimize this cost function c subject to these constraints. In fact, we are looking at a minimization problem and this is called an integer programming problem because the constraint is that these are all from the integer valued. And if x i is a constraint to be either 0 or 1, the integer programming problem is called a 0 1 integer programming problem. And in fact, there are standard techniques for solving integer programming problem and even commercial packages available. So, my job is therefore, to do what? Map my hardware software co design problem to that of an integer programming problem. There are other optimization schemes also. So, if I map to an optimization scheme, then I can run an optimization procedure to get an architecture generated automatically. And that is what is a CAD tool, completely computer aided design tool for this developing an embedded system. So, this is an example of an integer programming. So, this is a cost function. These are basically the constraint and I can get this solution which is an optimal solution. And here I am assuming that x 1, x 2, x 3 are between 0 and 1. Okay. So, let us look at a formulation because that is the more interesting part of it. The index set i denotes task graph nodes because I have to deal with task graph nodes. Index set l will denote the task graph node types that is they depending on the type of computation say DCT, square root, FFT different kinds of computations. And index set k h denotes hardware component types because I said already we can have hardware components for DCT a dedicated hardware component. So, hardware component types. Index set j is of hardware component instances and index set k p denotes processors. I can use multiple processors and all processors are assumed to be of the same type. So, I have got these sets. In fact, what is interesting and important to note is that what we are doing is we are assuming this kind of an index sets. Okay. So, that means I have got a library, library of possible architectures. And what I am try, which what I shall try out through an optimization problem that of mapping the task graph nodes to different elements of the library to get optimal cost. So, my solution is through a process of searching among the possible set of known architectures. 
Okay. So, that searching is being done through integer programming. So, the problem is that uh, we shall have x i k the variable is 1 if the node v i this is a v i of the task graph map to hardware component of type k. So, it is x i k k will be an element of k h okay, the set of possible architectures is 0 otherwise. And if node v i is mapped to processor k element of k p which is a set of processors and 0 otherwise. So, that means this is indicating x and y is indicating what whether I am designing a dedicated hardware or whether I am mapping it to a software. Okay. N y l k equal to 1 is another variable which says that if at least one node of type l is mapped to processor k equal to k p this is 1 otherwise it is 0. That means what we are telling is at least this task one instance of the task is mapped to a processor. T is a mapping from task graph nodes to their types because there are various types of computations. So, I need to know what type of computation each, each task graph node is really representing. And I can use variety of cost function. This is one cost function accumulates the cost of hardware units, cost of processors, cost of memories, cost of application specific hardware. Okay. Then we have to specify the constraints. This is operation assignment constraints. What it means? It means either the operation has to be associated either with the dedicated hardware or with a software. So, these constraints represent that. Variables are assumed to be integers and additional constraints to guarantee they are either 0 or 1. There will be other constraints as well. These constraints, what does it say? For all types of operations, the L is a set of possible operations. Okay. For all types of operations and for all nodes and of i of this type, if i is mapped to some processor k, then, then that processor must implement the functionality of L. Okay. So, if it is mapped, so what we say that if T v i is equal to C L, okay, so this is the corresponding mapping, then that corresponding processor has to implement this function. Okay. And decision variables must also be 0 1 variables and that is why for all L element of the set L types of computations and for all K which is element of K P that is a set of processors N Y L K this mapping has to be less than equal to 1. In fact, the values could be either 0 or 1. So, what we are telling is that effectively I am telling that the fun nodes have to be mapped constraints are telling you what? nodes have to be mapped either to hardware or to software and if a particular computation is mapped to a processor then that processor must implement that functionality. Okay. So, that has to be formally mathematically represented by these constraints. There would be other constraints now coming in. These constraints would come from design matrix. Okay. In the previous example, we have worked with only one constraint that was time. There could be other constraints as well. So, one constraint we are looking at the cost that is the area used for components in fact, uh, of that type is calculated as a sum of the cost of the components of that type that is the area gets added up. This cost should not exceed its maximum if I put a maximum area constraint. This gives you a constraint on the data memory. I would not like to use data memory beyond a bound. This gives you a constraint on instruction memory, the program memory which is to be used. Okay. Then you will have uh, total cost of data memory should not exceed its maximum. The total cost of hardware components should not also exceed its maximum and instruction memory should also not exceed its maximum. And we also talk about time constraints, there may be multiple time constraints used to guarantee that some time constraints are made. So, what we have got? We have got constraints now on the area, we have got constraints in terms of memory usage, we can have constraints in terms of time. So, these are all design constraints. So, what I am trying to do is now that I have got a set of task nodes the graph representing their dependencies, control dependencies. I have got a set of possible architectures. I have got the constraints. I have got the cost function. I need to find out a mapping which would minimize 
this cost function such that all these constraints are satisfied. Is this clear? So, we can get if we take an example, let us say this is my task graph. I am just looking at a part of the mapping. So, what I can get? I can get that these are the nodes of the task graphs which can get mapped to an ASIC. These task nodes of the task graph gets mapped to a processor. These E3, E4 are communication tasks. They get mapped to the communication channel or the bus by which the processor and the ASIC should get connected. And the scheduling problem will come to what? How these tasks are to be scheduled? Okay, so, if there are two tasks which has been mapped onto that is V3, V4 has been mapped onto ASIC. Now, what is the order in which they should be scheduled? Okay. Similarly, if V7, V8 getting mapped onto this processor P1, how are these to be scheduled and how communication is to be scheduled so that I satisfy the constraints of the task graph. So, these conditions can also be formally represented say for all nodes that are potentially mapped to the same processor or hardware component instance introduce a binary decision variable. Okay. And you say 1 if v i 1 is executed before v i 2 that means, I am depicting what the precedence relation straightforward precedence relation. And you can define the constraints in terms of end time and start times. Ensure that the schedule for executing operations is consistent with the precedence constraints in the task graph. I cannot do away with that okay, because that is a basic constraint which has come from the system model itself. So, let us take an example to understand this integer programming. Let us say this is a simple task graph and these are the execution times. Now, how you have obtained these estimates? That is basically a key problem, but I am assuming such estimates are available okay, because I, if you remember I told you this performance estimation is a critical component for all these exercises. So, I have got these estimations maybe through simulation or otherwise. So, I have got hardware types H1, H2, H3 and they have got costs associated 20, 25 and 30. We have got a processor which is of type P and the tasks are T1 to T5 and for each task these are the execution times on the different hardware components and that of the processor. Okay. So, effectively what I need to find out? I need to find out a solution such that the cost would be optimized satisfying the constraints. This is an example of a constraint. The first constraint is telling you that the task has to be either mapped to the dedicated hardware or to the processor. So, you will find that these constraint would translate to these kinds of expressions because I other possibilities does not arise because the task 2 cannot be mapped to H1. It can only be mapped to either H2 or to the processor that means, either pure software solution or mapped to this kind of a dedicated hardware. So, I have got this constraint, this is operational assignment constraints. So, now the other operational assignment constraint is what? Assume types of tasks are L1, 2, 3, 3 and 1, these are the different kinds of tasks. So, what it says if you look into it, the functionality 3 to be implemented on processor if node 4 is mapped to it. Okay, because that is mapped to type of functionality 3. The node 4 is mapped to type of functionality 3. Since it is mapped to type of functionality 3, then the processor is it is implementing it because if node 4 is mapped to it. So, this is basically the operational assignment constraint which says that if it is mapped to a processor, processor must implement that functionality. So, let us look at uh, other equations. There will be time constraints because other constraints would now come into the picture. We are looking at a time constraint, one constraint for the time being application specific hardware required for time constraints under 100 time units. And we are defining this as a cost function, this 20, 25, 30 is cost of these hardwares and this should be multiplied by the number of these units being used plus the cost of the processor plus the cost of the memory. So, this is what we would like to minimize satisfying this time constraint and other operational assignment constraints. So, let us look at an result okay. for a time constraint of 100 time units and cost of the processor P if it is less than cost of H3. 
So, what I have done? In this case, you will find that I have mapped T1 to H1, T2 to H2, T5 to H1, T3 and T4 to P1. Okay. Now, if you look at the time constraint, the time constraint will come from 20 plus 20 and this T5 is, is mapped to H1. So, I am using 2 units of H1 that is 20. So, I get a time constraint along this path less than 100. Along the other path is also less than 100 because I am mapping T3 and T4 to the processor which is 10 plus 10, 20. Okay. So, I have got a solution which satisfies the time constraint and what I, why I said that the cost of processor P is less than that of H3 and that is the reason why I have used the mapping them onto the software instead of using a dedicated hardware. So, I am optimizing on the cost because I have to satisfy the constraints and after satisfying the constraints among the possible solutions, if I am choosing a solution whose cost is less, then I have to map the task T3 and T4 to the processor. So, I have got this assignment and these problem can be solved through an integer programming toolbox. So, what I am telling is I have got an automated mechanism for solving the problem. I am not doing a manual exploration of different possibilities. In fact, the all these kinds of techniques are used for these kind of software hardware co-design and partition. So, today what we have looked at, we have looked at steps involved in hardware and software partitioning and we have understood formulation of the partitioning task as an optimization problem. In fact, all through it was an optimization problem, either you manually try it out or use an automated algorithm with a set of possible target architectures to get a feasible solution. Any questions? Okay, the question is if I am using a dedicated hardware for two functions, whether I am using one of them or two of them. In this case, actually I am using two of them because use of both, use of two H1 would add to the cost. Okay? So, when we are talking about a dedicated hardware, the model that we have used for this example is that it is implementing only one function. So, if I need two of them, there will be two instances of that hardware element. Thank <laughs> you.